Good morning, good morning and welcome. Welcome to each and every one of you on this new day. I'm Reverend Joanna. I'm on the pastoral staff here at North Congregational United Church of Christ, or you may know us by our digital name, which is Just North. We are grateful this morning to have this opportunity to worship together with you in this way and on this day. Pastor Guy is our interim pastor, and he will be back with us next week to lead worship and to preach again. Today is the second Sunday of Lent, and this year our Lenten theme here at North is journeying toward healing and wholeness. It's a journey that we are on together. It's a journey that calls us to participate in the healing of the world around us. And as we do, we often find healing for ourselves as well. This morning, we will all be blessed by the uplifting music that Margot and our virtual choir have planned for today. And once again, Dee will share an inspiring story for all ages in honor of Black History Month. Today we are grateful to Mark for serving as our scripture reader and to our moderator, Diane, who will send us on our way with words to ground us and prepare us for the week ahead. And as always, we are ever so thankful for our worship team and our tech team who make online worship possible for all of us week in and week out. Again, welcome, welcome to you all. And now, let us worship God together. join us in the call to worship. I will read the commandments. Please join Carrie in the response. Here are the commandments of God to God's people. 
I am your God who brought you out of bondage. You shall have no other gods but me. Amen. God, have mercy. You shall not make for yourself any idol. Amen. God, have mercy. You shall not invoke with malice the name of God. Amen. God, have mercy. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Amen. God, have mercy. Honor your parents. Amen. God, have mercy. You shall not commit murder. Amen. God, have mercy. You shall not commit adultery. Amen. God, have mercy. You shall not steal. Amen. God, have mercy. You shall not be a false witness. Amen. God, have mercy. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. Amen. God, have mercy. Thank you. 
Hi everyone. Well, I did have a challenge this week to sharing the story to you from outside. Found a beautiful mural at Capital University. It was purple like the color of our book. It had stars like the color of our book. And the message was perfect is you have to go through the darkness to uh, see the stars. And Sue, our little girl in the book, um, Sue means star. That's her name. And um, I saw the mural one day, went the next day to record the story, and the mural was gone. So I'm improvising with a beautiful, beautiful tapestry behind me, borrowed from Kim and Chris, and I'm going to share the story to you from right here at my house. So Sue by Lupita Nyong'o. Sue was born the color of midnight. She looked nothing like her family, not even a little, not even at all. Mama was the color of dawn, Baba the color of dusk, and Mitchell's sister was the color of high noon. Hardly anyone at school looked like Sue either. People gave her sister Mitch pet names like Sunshine and Ray and Beauty. People gave Sue names like Blackie and Darkie and Night, and Sue felt hurt every time. She hid away while her sister made lots of friends. Sue dreamed of being the same color as her sister, she wanted friends too. So she got the biggest eraser she could find and tried to rub off a layer or two of darkness. That hurt. She crept into mama's room and helped herself to some makeup. Oh no, she was gonna hear about this from mama. She decided to work from the inside out and ate only the lightest, brightest foods. With a stomach ache, she went to bed and turned to God for a miracle. Dear Lord, why do I look like midnight when my mother looks like dawn? Please make me as fair as the parents I'm from. I want to be beautiful, not just to pretend. I want to have daylight. I want to have friends. If you hear me, my Lord, and would like to comply, may I wake up as bright as the sun in the sky. Amen. When Mama came in to wake her for school the next morning, Sue rose to find not a trace of daylight in her midnight skin. Sue told Mama everything. Mama asked, what is your name? Sue, she muttered, and what does it mean? Star, she whispered. Brightness is not in your skin, my love. Brightness is just who you are. As for beauty, Mama said, rubbing Sue's stomach like she did to comfort her, you are beautiful, Sue sighed. Well, you are beautiful to me, but you can't rely on what you look like to make you feel beautiful, my sweet. Real beauty comes from your mind and your heart. It begins with how you see yourself, not how others see you. Now, you get up and out you go. How could she, as dark as she was, have brightness in her? How could she have beauty when no one but her mother seemed to see it? How could she be a star? That night, a shooting star appeared at Sue's window. The night sent me, the star said, come with me. Sue hopped under the star and off they went. Long ago at the beginning of time, said the star, there was night and day and they were sisters. They loved each other very much, but people didn't treat the sisters the same. People gave day pet names like lovely and nice and pretty. People gave night names like scary and bad and ugly. She felt hurt every time. Well, night got fed up and walked right off the earth. They stayed behind and enjoyed making everybody happy in the sun, but then day grew too long. They began to really miss her sister, and so did everyone else. They had, <clears throat> there had to be a way to get her back. Day set off to find night, and she did. I miss you, said Day. I miss you too, said Night, but you don't know what it's like to be treated badly for being dark. You're right, I don't, Day said. But what I do know is that we need you just the way you are. Come and see. 
Night returned and the people rejoiced. We need the darkest night to get the deepest sleep. We need you so that we can grow and dream and keep our secrets to ourselves. The stars chimed in. Brightness isn't just for daylight. Light comes in all colors and sunlight can only be seen in the, seen in the dark. While day had a golden glow, with night, everything had a silver sheen, elegant and fine. Day told her sister, when you are darkest is when you are the most beautiful. It is when you are most you. Could it be that night did not need to change? Not even a little? Not even at all? Now the day and night were back together. A little bit of night returned to the day in the form of shadows and a little bit of day returned to the night in the form of moonlight. They were inseparable from that moment on and promised to celebrate the brightness in each other, whether people chose to see it or not. You see, the star explained, we need them both on their sunniest day and their darkest night and every shade in between. Together, they make the world we know light and dark, strong and beautiful. So when rose the next morning, there'd be no hiding anymore. She belonged out in the world, dark and beautiful, bright and strong. And if she ever needed a reminder of her brightness, she could look up at the sky on the darkest night to see for herself. Sue felt beautiful inside and out. I wonder if you ever wish to be a little bit more like somebody else. I wonder what makes you shine. I wonder how your shininess or your beauty interacts with others. I have chosen a new song for dancing and remember to put it on Facebook this time. So you can pause the service, dance your wiggles out, and then maybe make a drawing about something that makes you unique. What makes you shine? You could also listen to this book again on Netflix Bookshare, Celebrating Black Voices. And it's read by Miss Nyong'o, the author of the book. And I found out they're going to be making a movie about this book. How cool is that? So <clears throat> let's put our right hands and our left hands together. Dear God, thank you for the sisters of daylight and night. For shadows and stars. Remind us to see all the beauty in ourselves. Help us to celebrate the ways our family, friends, and community shine. Amen. All right, great. We'll see you next week.
A reading from Genesis 17, 1 through 7 and 15 through 16. When Abram was 99 years old, God appeared and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and rulers shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. I will be your God and the God of your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Rulers of people shall come from her. A reading from Romans 4, 13 through 25. For the promise made to Abraham and Sarah and their descendants that they would inherit the world did not depend on the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all of Abraham and Sarah's descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham and Sarah, for they are parents of all of us, as it is written, I have made you parents of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom they believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, Abraham and Sarah believed they would become the parents of many nations, according to what was said. So numerous shall your descendants be, Abraham and Sarah, without growing weak in faith, thought about their bodies, which were very old. He was about a hundred years old, and she was beyond childbearing age. Still, they never questioned or doubted the promise of God, but grew strong in faith and gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do whatever was promised. Therefore, their faith was credited to them as righteousness. Now the words was credited to them were written not for their sake alone, but for ours also. It will be credited to us who believe in the one who raised Jesus our Savior from the dead, who was handed over to death for our sins and was raised for our justification. A reading from Mark 8, 31 through 38. Then Jesus began to teach them that the promised one must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priest and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. Jesus said all of this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan! For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Jesus called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, 
and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the promised one and the holy angels will also be ashamed when they come before our God in glory. Here ends our readings. Thank you, Mark, for serving as our scripture reader this morning. Would you all please pray with me? Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Speak to us this day through your word. Melt us, mold us, fill us, and use us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. In Jesus' sweet name we pray, amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning again to all of you. Well, here we are on this second Sunday in Lent already. You may have noticed last Sunday that our worship team recently changed our altar pyramids and the liturgical banner that for this new church season. And, as you may know, the Lenten color purple is traditionally understood to represent the royalty and the passion of Christ. However, in the world of psychology, the color purple is associated with introspection. The color purple is known to awaken our senses while also promoting that quiet space within ourselves that is necessary in order to cultivate insight and increase awareness. And that is certainly in keeping with the mood of this season, given that the Lenten journey invites us to a deeper place within ourselves through contemplation and reflection and prayer. Now, every, time, every year at this time, when I'm especially tired of this cold and wintry weather, it sure has been a very long winter this year, I need to remind myself that the origin of the word Lent is translated as the lengthening of days. Practically speaking, what that means is that the sun will set tonight, Sunday night, here in Columbus at 6.23 p.m. And, and I'm very heartened to know that in just one month from now, on March 28th, the sun will set that evening at 7.52 p.m. Bit by bit, the days are indeed lengthening. And so, it seems apropos that as the days are being stretched out before us during this Lenten season, that we are also being stretched within as we look deeper, as we turn to God, and as we find support from one another on this journey that we're on together, this Lenten journey toward healing and wholeness. And, and we are also, of course, stretched by the scripture readers, readings throughout this Lenten season as they tend to be challenging texts packed with deep emotion and meaning, like our gospel reading from Mark that Mark Cortez read so beautifully 
for us this morning. No matter how familiar this story may be, it is still very difficult and dramatic and even disturbing. The tension and the deep feeling in this story is palpable. Let's take a closer look. First of all, we find Jesus teaching his disciples as usual. But this time, he was preparing them for what would take place. And he is very clear with them. He doesn't mince words. He tells them like it is. He tells them that he will be rejected by the religious authorities and that he'll undergo great suffering and that he'll even be killed. And after three days, he will be resurrected. And then, understandably so, Peter responds. And clearly, Peter doesn't approve of what Jesus is saying. And not only that, but Peter rejects what Jesus has said. Does Peter not understand? Is it too painful for him to process and acknowledge? Does Peter actually think that he knows better than Jesus? While it's not clear what motivated Peter's response, what is clear is that Peter rebuked Jesus. He criticized him and even attempted to correct him, to correct the one, the one who he had just acknowledged was the Messiah back in verse 28. But Peter, Peter certainly doesn't have the last word here. Jesus responds. He responds immediately and sharply by saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. It is quite a dramatic moment. And then Jesus uses the passion and the emotion of that moment as a teachable moment for the crowd that had gathered around them. He turns to them and he says to them, For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. What do Jesus' words mean here? What do they mean for Peter and for the disciples and for those crowds that had gathered around him all those years ago, those 2,000 years ago? And what do his words mean for us today? What does it look like? To set one's mind on human things rather than on divine things. What does it mean to save one's life by losing it for Jesus' sake and for the sake of the gospel? As I was wrestling with this text recently, once again, just as I have done many times before, I was reminded this time about what I learned several years ago in my training as a spiritual director about the principle of consolation within Ignatian spirituality. Now, given my UCC Protestant background, I had known very little about Ignatius of Loyola, the 16th century Catholic theologian. But back then, a few years back now, at that stage in my life, I was very drawn to some of his teachings. This concept of consolation 
describes the experience of moving toward God and toward God's active presence in the world around us. Consolation happens when we feel balanced and when we feel closely connected to community and when we have empathy for others, when we are able to see the joys and the sorrows of other people, and when we are able to recognize where God is active in our lives and where God is leading us. In our gospel reading for this morning, Jesus calls us and challenges us and commands us to deeply examine the lives that we lead. What is the source of our lives? What gives us life? What subtracts from our lives? What disconnects us from living fully, from our living wholeheartedly? What connects us to one another? How do we cultivate life within the world around us? What is life giving to us and through us? You know, during these past several days, as I was engaging with our reading from Mark, and reflecting on that which gives me life, I became keenly aware of the quiet and subtle signs of new life that are becoming evident during these last weeks of winter. There has been a whole lot of sunshine this past week, and the temperatures are gradually increasing. The snow is melting, the grass is greening, and the ground is softening. And I have been reminded that there is so much life and growth that has been taking place throughout this long winter. Growth that is not yet apparent to the eye. New life that we will all witness in just weeks from now. And because I have had a bad case of spring fever already, I've asked a couple of the photographers among us here at North to share their photos of early spring from years past with all of us this morning. The first photo I want to share with you is a picture taken by Diane Farabi. I refer to it as the defiant daffodil against the backdrop of the snow-covered ground. Diane explained to me that the potted daffodil is actually indoors, sitting on her windowsill. Still, I see it as a promise of what is yet to come, come April. The next picture is from Chris Isaacs. It's a photo that she took on an early spring walk in the woods near her home a couple of years ago. It's a fern of some sort. Fresh new life, green, and just unfurling and pushing through that which has already seen its season. Next, we have another photo from Diane. It's a spring bush in her neighborhood. And here we see the vibrant pink buds that seem to be bending toward the light and just beginning to open, each one in its own way, 
and at its own pace. And the last one I'll show you is another one that Chris took near her home. A budding taking place. Bright and purple, noticeable and yet subtle. Apart, alone, and yet well supported. Thank you, Chris and Diane, for sharing your exquisite photos with all of us this morning. Images that inspire and images that connect us to the source of all life. And my hope is that the rest of you who enjoy taking photos outdoors will share your pictures with all of us this spring by posting them on our internal Facebook page. Our Lenten worship theme this year is journeying toward healing and wholeness. It's a theme that in encourages us to reflect on that which brings healing and wholeness to our lives and to the world around us. It's a theme that invites us to identify that which is the source of our lives and of all of our living. It's a theme that turns our hearts to Scripture and to God's creation and to one another and to that quiet place within as we seek the answer to the question that we must ask ourselves along the journey. Is it life-giving? Is it life-giving? And so I ask you, what gives you life. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us now enter into our time of prayer as we lift up the prayers of the people together. After I share each prayer request, I will say the words, God in your mercy, and I invite you to respond by saying, hear our prayer. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Many of you will remember Ella Miyashiro, a longtime member here at North and truly a saint within the life of our congregation. Ella died this past Friday in Florida, where she lived near her daughter Beth. Let us hold Dave and his extended family close in our hearts and prayers during this time as we give thanks for Ella's generous spirit, her giving heart, her helping hands, her humble presence, and all of the behind the scenes ways that she cared for all of us throughout the years. God, in your mercy, here our prayer. Beth Marler requests prayers of peace and comfort for Susan and Tom and Diane as they support each other during Tom's last days. God in your mercy, hear our prayer. Ed Snively lifts up prayers for Tom, Susan, and their family members. Ed also asks for your prayers for Liam, a six-year-old boy who is having trouble learning in kindergarten. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bob Jenkins requests your continued prayers for his health and healing as he remains hospitalized and undergoes numerous tests, procedures, and consultations to determine the best plan of treatment for his heart condition. God in your mercy, hear our prayer. Chris Isaacs asks for your prayers of strength and healing 
for her dad, Frank, who had surgery this past Friday and is now recovering at home. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Marilyn Orlos requests our prayers for her brother-in-law, Steve. Steve is having trouble breathing and was just taken to the hospital yesterday morning. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Josh Clapp asks for prayers of help for his cousin in Texas. She has no power or running water due to the bad weather. Josh also asks for prayers of thanksgiving for his recovery from surgery that continues to go well. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Sandy Flenner offers up prayers for Jean, who is Steve's sister, who once again has heart-related issues following her recovery from COVID-19. Sandy also asks for prayers for her friend, Joe, who had brain surgery this past Friday. Please pray for a speedy recovery and a full recovery. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Beth Rice writes, please add my sister to the prayer chain. She was walking to her car to go to work and she fell on the ice and broke her ankle. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Ruthann Farthing offers up prayers for students and staff who are preparing to return to in-person learning this week. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Steve Baker and Cindy Baber offers up prayers of gratitude to be able to rejoin the living, as Steve puts it. This past year has been very challenging, complicated by health concerns for both of them, especially for Cindy. They are now both happy to be able to celebrate their sixth wedding anniversary this coming month on March 7th. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. After I offer the pastoral prayer, we'll close with the Lord's Prayer as we always do. And you are invited, of course, to use whatever rendering is most meaningful to you. For our pastoral prayer this morning, I'd like to share a prayer that was written by Mary McLeod Booth Bethune about a hundred years ago. As you may know, she was an educator, a stateswoman, a philanthropist, a humanitarian, a womanist, and a civil rights activist. Let us pray. Father, we call thee Father because we love thee. We are glad to be called thy children and to dedicate our lives to the service that extends through willing hearts and hands to the betterment of all humankind. We send a cry of thanksgiving for people of all races, creeds, classes, and color the world over and pray that through the instrumentality of our lives, the spirit of peace, joy, fellowship, and brotherhood shall circle the world. We know that this world is filled with discordant notes, but help us, Father, so as to unite our efforts that we may all join in one harmonious symphony for peace and brotherhood justice, and equality of opportunity for all people. The tasks performed today with forgiveness for all of our errors, we dedicate, dear Lord, to thee. Grant us strength and courage and faith and humility sufficient for the tasks assigned to us. O loving parent God, we lift up this prayer we lift up all of the prayers of our hearts to you, including those that haven't been given voice. We know that you hear 
and respond to each and every one of them. And so we lift them all to you in the name of your precious begotten, our sovereign and our savior, who taught us to pray, saying, our mother and father God, who art in heaven and within, hallowed be thy many names, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Your week has brought some rays of sunshine and hope to you with the melting snow and warmer temperatures that we've enjoyed. 
Well, lately, I've been thinking about angels, so that's what I'd like to talk about this morning, angels. It's been said that angels are sent by God to deliver messages of encouragement and inspiration. But how do we recognize angels? We might be in the presence of angels and don't realize it. It might be someone we know, or it could be a random person who happens to mention just the things you need to hear at that moment. It might be a scary close call when an unseen something or someone intervenes at just the right moment to avert a calamity. Could these be angels sending you a message or tapping you on your shoulder? I don't really know the answer to that, but I would like to think so. And I do know there are living angels all around us. I've seen some of them this past week, and I want to acknowledge some of them in our midst. Someone answering an urgent call to clear snow from a driveway. Someone offering generous and continued support for a hospice friend and family. Friends continuing to check in on friends and all the worship angels who provide beautiful and meaningful worship every Sunday. And of course, there are many other quiet angels who do ordinary things that make extraordinary differences to others. As you go through your week, I hope you'll take note of the angels around and within you. And may you be gentle with yourself and be of good heart. For some announcements in our Zoom meetings, a quick reminder about virtual Narthex today at noon and every Sunday. We enjoy seeing faces that we haven't seen for a while, as well as our regulars. So please join us to say hi. We'd love to see you. Wednesday evening book study webs will take place Wednesday from 7 to 8.30 p.m. Virtual discussion of the bestseller Stamped will continue through March 24th. I highly recommend this book. Virtual Sunday Journeys for our middle and high school youth begins today, February 28th, with our conversation centered around Tiffany Jewell's book entitled, This Book is Anti-Racist. The conversation will take place from 1 to 2 p.m. Links to Zoom can be found on the internal Facebook page and in personal emails to parents. Looking forward to seeing all of our youth. And if you need the Zoom links, contact Susan Yutze by email or text. Bible study will be with Pastor Guy Friday from 1030 to noon. Now, let's turn to our call to offering. The Stewardship Board continues to offer several options available to support our various ministries. You may send a check to the church, use the donate button on our Just North website, schedule payments, or use Zelle through our bank. As always, please hear our gratitude for continuing your support for our church and our ministries. Now, please join me in our prayer of dedication. For gifts given and received, O oh God, we offer thanks and praise. May we share our abundance with all who have need. May we share our hope in like measure. Amen. Before we share our peace with each other this morning, please take a moment to just hug yourself and know that others are sharing their hugs with you right now. And now let's open our hearts to share our peace with each other. So we'll start by placing both hands over our hearts, then slowly remove them with arms outstretched and hands open to give and receive peace. When I extend my open hands to you, I'm opening my heart to you. I'm saying that I'm vulnerable and not trying to hide. I'm offering my peace to you. As you do this at home, try visualizing those people to whom you are sending peace this morning. 
try to visualize their faces as you open your heart and extend peace to them. Then if you like to think of a special place that brings you peace and calm, spend just a second or two in that place and center yourself. As we share this important tradition of sharing peace, we know that although we're not physically together, we are connected in heart and spirit. So peace be with you this morning, my North Church friends. Receive now these words of going forth. Siblings in Christ, may God our creator renew in us the creative spirit that brings healing and life to all of creation. May Jesus the Christ sustain us in boundless grace and love. And may the Holy Spirit fill us with courage to be bearers of God's hope in the world. Go in peace, seek peace, be at peace. Amen.